This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. I just received a letter from a student who thanked me for instilling the love of math in him. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond, and I'm delighted to have three guests. I guess I could start with three colonels walked into the General Assembly. <laughs> People thought I was going to say something yeah. else. <laughs> uh, it's just delightful to have the three of you, House colleagues, Delegate Lingenfelter, Delegate Anderson, Delegate Dudenpfeffer, all colonels in three different branches of the military. And we really want to talk about military issues today here in the General Assembly. If you want to talk worldwide, you, you're certainly welcome to do that, too. But I'd like to start with the question of, you served your country. How come you decided to serve the Commonwealth of Virginia? Delegate Ligenfelter, you've been in the longest in serving here at the General Assembly. Why don't you start? And then your two colleagues and other branches uh, join in the conversation. Well, it it wasn't supposed to be that way. I ha I'd uh, had no plan to to run for the general assembly, and then the opportunity uh, happened in 2001, and I did so, and and uh, have been elected down here since since then. You know, I think that all three of us have our own stories as to why we um, decided to enter the military. But I think that the one common denominator is our love of country. I mean, we really yes. love this country. Um, and I think that when you have devoted decades of your life to the service of the nation, <laughs> that's a hard sort of concept to shed. You know, you want to continue to, to stand and support the Constitution that you swore to defend uh, throughout your life. And so that was... I think a pretty significant motivation for me. In 2001, as I was looking around the country uh, and seeing the things that I saw, of course, you know, we had the tragedy of the 9-11 attacks at the Pentagon and at Ground Zero in New York City, at the towers. And all of those things came together for me that, you know, really and truly, we have to continue to serve and continue to be a voice for our Constitution, a voice for the founding principles, even after we have stopped wearing the cloth of the country. And so, and I'm sure my colleagues share in that. They, they were similarly situated, motivated to do so. Well, you've heard from the Army. You know, what about the Air Force and the Marines? Well, let the Air Force talk about it. I'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you. Go. Kind yeah. of similar to his in story. Sympathy of your... <laughs> oh, yeah. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> the, did, did we uh, mention that the Army beat the Navy? Uh, did we mention that? <laughs> that happened. Uh, yeah. th those things happen. Uh, for me, it happened in much the same way. I spent 30 years in a uniform. So collectively, between the three of us, we spent uh, nearly a century in uniform, 90 right. years. And so I, I would like to think that we get military and veterans issues, and we're all involved in that. Um, I had planned when I retired in 2009. I was in the Pentagon living in Prince William County, where Scott is. Is for, lives, and uh, I'd planned to go work for an aerospace company. It was kind of part and parcel mm. what I was doing in the Air Force, doing international overseas work. Um, 
but I kind of got a crook of the come hither finger that said service. This is about service. Yeah. You need to think about running for office. That's certainly not the only place to serve our commonwealth and country, but for me, that's the way it played out. Um, I think that each of us in the General Assembly, regardless of our views or perspectives, we get drawn to things that are somewhat reflective of life's experiences. And so with a broad cross-section of folks in the General Assembly, we kind of have subject matter experts on a wide array of issues. For the three of us, um, we have issues other than military and veterans issues, sure. but a significant amount of our focus and time is spent on military and veterans issues. Uh, I chair the General Assembly Military and Veterans Caucus with Bryce Reeves. It's a uh, bipartisan, bicameral body, so we have co-chairs. These guys have been very active and have been very energetic in bringing uh, veterans legislation for the duration of their time in the General Assembly. So with 800,000 Virginia veterans, and for Scott and I, 45,000 in Prince William County alone. 45,000. 45,000 alone. Um, we've we could got, start our own army. We <laughs> could start our own army. But uh, so we, um, we just feel called to serve. You know, that's, that's kind of, that, there's a reason that the armed forces are called the service. Yes, yes. In my case, a little different path to the same destination was um, I was preparing to retire to the good life, you know, the retired with a contractor job like what she's talking about. And, <laughs> so uh, much for that. A tragedy happened in my family that mm -hmm. um, made me become a little more politically active and then um, a realization that you can't really make a difference being the, the outsider. The only way to really make change is to become an insider. So service was built into me. I, my dad was in Korea. Uh, as a Marine in Korea, so I, I grew up with that culture hanging over me the whole time. And when um, when I was my activism part of me was awakened um, by that family tragedy, uh, this was the route to go. And it, you know, I served a uh, different, a little different path to get here. But I served six years on the Stafford County Board of Supervisors and, and got really close to to the people there. We have a high, high, um, re, you know, veterans retirement. Marine military guys, a lot of Marine retirees up there, guys, and um, it's it's been a pleasure to work with them. I I think uh, one thing I learned when I got here was that you can't be an expert in everything. There are so many mm -hmm. various issues, medical issues and stuff, and you know you find yourself finding people you respect and then depending on their expertise. And I think most of the General Assembly looks at the three of us when it comes to uh, veterans issues and understanding that we live that and that we, uh, we have a firsthand knowledge of what is important mm -hmm. to the veterans. And we all three have been extremely active in the, uh, the pursuit of providing the services our veterans need. Now we, we started saying three colonels and three colonels in the house, but mm -hmm. there are other veterans in the house uh, in, in all branches. Yes, there are. There are a total of 22 uh, House of Delegates members, so 22% in a 100-person House. So we have a high proportion in the House. The Senate is slightly lower. I forget the number of the Senate, to be quite frank, but we have a high number. Um, we have not only the three of us who served entire careers, there's another three or four who served entire careers, and then also a swath who served at least a tour or two, and when it comes to military and veterans issues, they get it. And, you know, we've, we're very blessed. We've got combat veterans as well, people right. who have been, I mean, we had a Vietnam veteran there. And, mm -hmm. I mean, and this, this sort of mix of veterans' views is important right. as well because we'll, we, in reviewing legislation, we'll catch things. I mean, we'll say, do we really intend to do this? And, and sometimes people will bring veterans. Everybody loves veterans, okay? And some right. of our colleagues who aren't veterans will bring legislation that affects veterans but when we look at it, we say, do you understand there's some unintended consequences here if you do X, Y, and Z? And mm -hmm. so this notion of depending on your colleagues for their expertise is important. And, and in that role, we're kind of the keeper of the roles, if you will, uh, not like the clerk, but keeper of the roles when it comes to common sense veteran legislation. We're, we're the guys that people can come to and say, if I do this, will this actually help or 
are there other issues we should look at? And so we mm -hmm. we wind up taking a lot of things apart, mm -hmm. you know, and try to try to make sure that when veterans issues come out of the General Assembly, we're we're not passing bad bills. And the worst bill we ever pass is the bill with unintended consequences. Yes, right. yes. The, the three of you probably are in some ways representative of the other veterans in in the General Assembly too. One, a Virginia native mm -hmm. from Roanoke, and then two who really came to Virginia I'm from other states. Well, no. I was born in New York City, but I got here as fast as I could. I mean, I think I was six months old. But oh. He's got a lot of Virginia stink <laughs> on him. Yeah. Well, in my case, the Marine, I ended here. Um, I, you know, I've lived here for almost 25 years, but uh, the Marine Corps, my Marine Corps career brought me here. And the Marine Corps base at Quantico is considered the crossroads of the Corps. Mm -hmm. And almost all mil Marine officers begin and end their career here. It's a pretty, uh, pretty high concentration. So I ended up here. I, I did two tours back to back before I retired here. So worked in the Pentagon, which is very painful, and uh, worked at Quantico and Manpower. A good kind of pain. <laughs> it's a good kind of pain. And one thing that and Rich has worked in this area a lot too. We, the, although we're not directly affected or I should say we can't directly affect what the Congress does with respect to military procurement and spending and taking care of the services. But one of the roles we do play is to make sure that Virginia is known to be a veteran-friendly state because mm -hmm. when the federal right. government looks at the different states, they ask themselves, was well, this a place we want military to be? Or is this state mm -hmm. postured to do the kinds of things that, that make it attractive for us to make additional investments. So when Mark brings up the whole issue of the of the Quantico, think Belvoir, think Fort Lee, think Langley, think all the military facilities around mm -hmm. Virginia, the naval base in, in Norfolk, all these things are important. So we work very hard uh, to ensure that we have a veteran-friendly mm -hmm. environment. Yeah, and the economic impact of those bases he talked oh, about yes. is an, an amazing huge. part mm -hmm. of the economy mm -hmm. of Virginia. Absolutely And huge. it's important that we, we understand what their needs are. We talk to veterans, uh, people we serve with, people who uh, we meet on the street, people who write into us. Uh, they're, when they talk to us about their issues, it's like, oh, yeah, I, well, I understand that. We need to fix that. And uh, we've we've really gone a long way to doing that. Mm -hmm. And the part of the Commonwealth where the two of you, well, all three of you in your area, mm -hmm. another Veterans Care Center to, to be built. Again, showing, showing the, the concern that the Commonwealth has. And if our viewers don't know, you can tell the story about how the General Assembly stepped up to get this done before the federal government yeah. was really. Well, well the, sh the short version is this. Uh, we already have two Virginia Veterans Care Centers here, one in Roanoke, one in Richmond, um, and they fill the gap that the VA, the Federal Veterans Administration, can't fill. So in the session of 2016, Delegate Kirk Cox, Majority Leader of the House, was the chief patron of a bill to broaden that footprint and to put in a Veterans Care Center in Northern Virginia and one in Hampton Roads. So you'd have one in Northern, Central, Eastern, and Western, so great coverage for the state. And so uh, worked very hard, we did, to put her in Prince William County, but the final decision was it went to another competitive county, which Scott also represents, Fauquier County, which I'm perfectly content with because it's just a few thousand feet outside of Prince William County, and actually it's more strategically located being in Fauquier County where it is. It, it provides access to a larger number of folks. So the plan, moving ahead, entirely with Virginia resources, not right. relying on the Veterans right. Administration at all, was to uh, break ground in October of 2017 and a door swing open in October of 2019. This yeah. was tremendous leadership on the part of, of Kurt Cox and others and mm -hmm. the General Assembly Riches was right at the center of this as well. Chris Stolle, who by the way is a Navy veteran, was very much uh, involved in it as well because one of the facilities <laughs> will be in Hampton Roads. Mm -hmm. We were very happy that this facility was located in Northern Virginia. But it's an important thing for viewers to know that we thought that the federal government was gonna partner with us on this. In fact, in previous years, right. we actually put money mm -hmm. up and said, well, we will match what the federal investment was. They kind of gave us the impression they were gonna go and do it, and then they pulled back and took the money out. And I think 
out of a certain degree of commitment and some frustration, we said, okay, enough is enough. We are going to do this mm -hmm. out of Virginia right. dollars right. for Virginia mm -hmm. veterans. If the federal government can't figure out how to do this right, we will figure out how to do it right. Mm -hmm. So at some point in time, if the federal government is willing to reimburse the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth will take it. We're but in the not meantime, holding our <laughs> breath. Yeah, 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 amen. Yeah, yeah, amen. But I, I think there is yeah. also in Washington a new focus on fixing the VA. I think uh, mm -hmm. in the past Correct. they've thrown little Band-Aids at it and whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that this new administration, whatever you want to say about it, are gonna, they're going to fix it. And that's mm -hmm. uh, President Trump. That's one of his things: is mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. I'm going to fix it. We're going to win with it. And uh, I think we're going to see tremendous improvements mm -hmm. from the federal government on this. Because it wasn't that long ago there was going to be some effort, something about Veterans' Choice that would allow someone to go to a hospital that couldn't get in. It seemed like that kind of just mm -hmm. moved extremely slowly. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see it pick up. I yeah, think with the change be... of administration, you know, it gives you the opportunity. This is kind of an overworn phrase, but it gives the opportunity to set the reset button and uh, think about a whole range of issues. And as Mark said, one of those is going to be, I believe, repairing the Veterans Administration. You know, and it, if you really look at it, David, it's, it's important that we get this right. I mean, Rich frequently reminds us on the floor about people who wear the cloth of, of the military and I think that's a great way to express this because we we love the country we we lived our lives ready to give up our lives um, and for those veterans who didn't make it home it's very emotional for us to even think about this right now but the truth of the matter is for the veterans who have come home they were the ones who were ready to give the full mm -hmm. measure of devotion and die on the battlefield for this country and our view is you can't do enough. You can't do enough for people who are willing to lay down their lives. And I think that this administration really, I hope, will have a tremendous focus on, on our veterans. Because the truth is, we can do certainly quite a bit for veterans in Virginia. But so much of that agenda is set in Washington. And if they get it right there, it will blossom here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. We Correct. can't forget about the families of veterans. That's um, right. Yes. You know, we, we get caught up in talking about a veteran, but when you talk about a veteran, you're talking about a family. It's a family. A family. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's usually a spouse behind it that's holding everything together while we did what we had to do. Mm -hmm. And they've been very supportive. I've been married 37 years. I think these guys have similar stories of wives who we couldn't have done what we did without them taking care of and holding our families together while we were off, uh, you know, participating in that is the that is so true. I'm actually writing a book right now on the Gulf War. I kept diaries during the Gulf War. Oh, excellent! And Mark is exactly right. One as I went through my diaries and looked, that theme kept coming back. What Shelley was doing to try to keep the the home fires mm -hmm. working, and she didn't know where I was. She didn't know what we were doing. Well, we've we've lived that life, mm -hmm. and our our spouses are. I mean, if. I don't know how we'd have made it, guys. Amen. Oh. Well, our spouses are veterans, <laughs> but I, you know, up by Quantico where I'm at, I run into a lot of young 21-year-old second lieutenants and wives who many of them are barely, t barely 20. And, you know, they, they, our wives have become the veterans who help them. And it's, it's a family, not, not just our families, but it's a university of families. Uh, actually, in, in my own case, my wife is a veteran. Um, each of us spent about 30 years in the military each. My wife spent 21, um, and is now she was called, much like the rest of us, she was called to service and now sits as the Occoquan District Supervisor on the Prince William Board of County Supervisors. And she's so a real politician. She, family, she's the one of achievement in the family. <laughs> but uh, right. we have in Virginia a very active Virginia Veterans and Family Services, VVFS division within the Virginia Department of Veterans Services. We've been very engaged with that. It was formerly known as the Wounded Warrior Program, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. has now broadened Virginia Veterans Family Services to include also the spouses and the dependents of those who have worn, as Scott said, the cloth of the country. And you know, we've also worked legislation, David, in recent years too, that recognize that when spouses come into Virginia, and let's say, you know, you have a spouse who has a civilian uh, job that, that he or she right. is doing, let's say a real estate agent, we've tried to really press on the state to quickly credential 
these folks when they come into Virginia, so mm -hmm. they can yeah, get about their point. lives again. Yep. So there are lots of there are lots of things we can do, but the bureaucracy sometimes pushes back right. hard. School teachers yeah. is another one of those. Excellent. Mm -hmm. we, you know, yeah. we have a shortage of school teachers. Nurses. I mean, just yeah. you can't right. just a whole list they, of things. They come in, they might only spend three, four years That's here, right. but they're integral to maintaining the quality of the schools. And you don't want them tied up for six, eight, ten months waiting to get you know, their credentials. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, I've, I've seen that over the last decade. I think you I don't know if there's any gaps because I think you've covered about every area. We always <laughs> discover a gap somewhere <laughs> and we just, we, we fill it, but there's always but things to be really done. We've been really nice to Delegate Anderson in this, in this thing. We're usually very brutal when it comes to, to our internal is, rivalry. These guys. Thank you for diverting yeah. this. <laughs> a good diversionary right. tactic by Mark Twain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, uh, in our closing minute, uh, any issues here in 2017 as the General Assembly is moving towards its end that you'd want to mention it's the viewers? the budget. Uh, I mean, yes. it's huge. I yes. mean, we've, had a, we've been in a very flat, slow-growth economy in the last eight years of the Obama administration. We really need to break out of this because the, the ripple effect that it has on states, not just Virginia, but all across the country, when you have very low performance in the economy. That directly affects our revenues. We can go all around this building, can't we guys? You cannot find a money machine that prints money anywhere in this building. Yeah. We only have the money that's earned by Un people. Unlike 90 miles north. Up like, well, yeah, they have a Xerox <laughs> machine that runs 24 hours a day. But in any case, the big challenge that we have is we have to balance the budget. We have a constitutional requirement to do that. We're going to do that. In fact, this weekend, we're all going to be working very hard to push this budget out uh, for the House to consider next week. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a very solid, balanced budget that wisely spends uh, taxpayer dollars and doesn't fritter them away on things that we have no business being involved in at the state level. So that's that's the big challenge in my right. view. But I think there are going to be some surprises that, um, you know, there have been some people very disappointed in the shortfalls in revenues we have. Mm, about $1.2 And, $1. Billion. and the, the way we've been able to identify some new resources that are going to fill some of the gaps of the promises that we made uh, when this budget was put in. And we'll let our viewers know that we're having the conversation here on the Friday just before crossover. Right, right. right. When they're seeing the three colonels and seeing this show, mm -hmm. they will have already seen some information about right. the budget. And you'll be beginning your deliberation in your chambers in the right. House and in the other chamber, right. too. Well, the, the House Appropriations Committee, Scott and I sit on that, uh, convenes on Sunday, and we'll report out our budget. So which goes we to the think House that floor. committee sits on us. Yeah, I mean, that's we, what it is. <laughs> that's more like the case. So we'll report it on Sunday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon uh, to the House floor, and from there we'll finish our work next week, and it's over in the Senate. Yes. One thing, I, if I could yes. close on, that surprised me when I got here, and it's the quality of our National Guard and the, and the people that are uh, there and how dedicated an they are to, to the job they do, the training they do, the deployments that they make. Um, it, it, it was it's something that has touched me because I, I didn't have any exposure to that in the past and uh, General Williams and, and those guys deserve to be patted on the back. I'm always upset when I run into a young person who says, well, I, I can't go to college, I can't afford it. And I always think, you just not looking because yeah. there are opportunities and things like the National Guard will not only send you to school, but they'll train you in a, a life skill and a job skill mm -hmm. that are just terrific. And they have fun and they, you know, they serve their country. It's, it's a, that citizen Some warrior. Some are deployed to Iraq even. Yeah. As yes. yes. They have this and to other, yeah. other undisclosed locations. It's yeah. pretty impressive yeah. what they do. They are completely integrated in the active force. Uh, it's, it's entirely seamless. It's one military, one fight. Yeah. The three of us went out to Fort Pickett um, to look at the, the TAD, the troops coming in for their two-week training, and I can tell you, they were as excited. We were Listen, more excited to see is, them we were than they were excited. We were so <laughs> happy. We were. We, right. we hopped into Black Hawk and, uh, and all, everything right. flashed back. Okay, we're right. getting ready to do the assault now. Yes. You should have had your cameras there. And oh. Watch these two guys go down the rappelling tower, <laughs> flying Dave around in helicopters. Sixty-five. That's a Legs, dangerous problem. Yeah, yeah sixty-five. That's a little, little yes. difficult. So. Yes. Yes. <laughs> they did it. Well, it, it's certainly a real pleasure to have the three of you on this week in Richmond. I know we've worked for a time and. 
Mr. Chairman here of Militia Police and Public Safety. We got this worked in just before he has his last meeting yeah. before yeah. crossover. Yeah. And as the viewers will be seeing this, we encourage them to pass this show on along to their friends in other, other states and to say you should come to the Commonwealth. Absolutely. So thank yeah. you all very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Enrichment is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.